let's get into it and let's recap. So, um, first of all, today, what we're going to talk about with ECS Workshop is we're going to actually just spend a good chunk of, of our time today talking about uh, capacity providers for ECS. Um, but before we get into that, yesterday, uh, we did a, we uh, deployed a cluster uh, with CloudWatch Container Insights enabled. We have a, a dashboard with Container Insights up and running, giving us that visibility into our cluster, our tasks, our services, um, as well as uh, we deployed a, a stateful workload. So we had a, a file manager service that we wanted to deploy as a, a container on ECS. Uh, it did require a stateful backend. So with that native functionality of ECS being able to uh, mount EFS volumes, uh, specifically we used Fargate, um, our serverless uh, container offering, we were able to mount an EFS uh, shared file system. Uh, EFS is our shared um, file system service. And we were able to mount that to our, uh, our task and run a stateful container uh, serverless, where literally I didn't have to manage a, a, a file system server, I didn't have to manage a file server, didn't have to manage EC2 infrastructure to run my container, all serverless, all oh, free. That's awesome. Uh, so no uh, compute to have to worry about configuring and patching, uh, just whatever's in your container, that's what's going to run. No file servers to have to worry about scaling no having to figure out how to pay for storage until you actually have to use it. I mean, this is this is what everyone really wants, right? Is only pay for it when you use it. And uh, if you're not using it, then it's, it's just available, but you're not having to actually spend any money on it. And you don't have to worry about like managing it and maintaining it. It's all done for you. Uh, that's pretty cool. I did have one question for you though. You were showing us the graphs and stuff. Can you go back to that screen? Yeah. Um, how much time did you spend like building this this thing? So uh, pre pre ECS and pre Container Insights days, a lot of time. Uh, but that, that was a joke. But to answer your question, on in this case, literally, I just enabled uh, Container Insights on our cluster. And this just, it built the dashboard for me. I didn't have to build this. This was there for me out of the box. Yeah, that's that's so cool because, yeah, there were, you know, I can remember days uh, back in the, the my SRE days that we would spend so much time building out dashboards to put up on TVs and stuff. And, and now, like, I'm, you could collapse that left sidebar and uh, totally put this up on a TV somewhere. And you know, have have the information that you need right at your fingertips, and you didn't have to spend any time uh, doing anything. And then, of course, when you want to drill down, uh, you have all the information available to you uh, to be able to drill down. Yeah. So, and you don't have to again, you don't have to run a time series database. You don't have to run uh, log aggregators and collectors and uh, metrics aggregators and collectors and and all that other stuff. I hope you're sensing a theme out there, Twitch, um, that this is, this is uh, we try and solve the common problems for you and turn them into just utility. You should just expect to have them. And um, then you can focus more on the stuff that you need to focus on, your own application and its logic and, and making all of that work. Yeah, well said. So, yeah, so, so this is the, the, the dashboard. And just to show you a couple of the things is I can look at my cluster from a, a cluster perspective um, to get overall utilization. I can drive, dive into ECS instances. So any of the if there's EC2 instances running my containers, I can check those stats. I can see services running in my cluster or clusters. So you can actually filter across multiple uh, clusters. And then I can get even deeper and look at the tasks. So remember we talked about this was, I think, on Monday or, or, or Tuesday, we, we mentioned an ECS service is just a way to deploy a set, uh, N number of tasks. And a task is just an instantiation of your container or containers that you want to run as a part of that task definition. So I, I, I can aggregate all that, my tasks here. I can see them 
uh, in real time. And I can always drill down per task as well. So if I just wanted to see what was going on with one task, I could do that as well. So really, cool. really neat stuff. Um, Very cool. All right. So, so let's go, let's go back and let's dive into capacity providers. So, um, you know, I, I think you know, capacity providers came because there was a need, you know, customers that were building on ECS, um, you know, one of the, I would say the things I heard a lot was uh, that, you know, when, when I'm managing ECS, I have to think about this is, you know, if I'm not using Fargate, by the way, this is, if I, if I, I'm using EC2 to run my containers. Um, I have to think about scaling at the, the instance level. So that data plane level, I have to think about scaling out because as my applications need to scale out, I need to also make sure that the demand of the applications can be met with capacity from that backend uh, virtual machine EC2 infrastructure, right? So uh, customers were writing their own, you know, uh, auto scaling mechanisms to do this, to achieve this. And ultimately um, we released, you know, capacity providers with cluster auto scaling. So this now takes that two faceted approach of when you're managing EC2, having to think about scaling that and scaling services. Now you only have to think about one thing and that's scaling your services. So it takes, again, as you said, now this becomes utility, Brent, right? Like, like you said earlier, Exactly. It, this becomes, if you, yeah, go ahead. Sorry. If you, if you think about what is the logic that, that you need to write that, you know, like, before this existed, you said people were writing their own. What would that logic have to look like? Well, you know, you could start off by just looking at how do you know when it's time to scale out? And one way to know is you have a deployment that's just sitting there waiting and nothing is, you know, your your new containers aren't actually getting deployed. Um, so that's one signal. And then the second the second thing that you'd have to know is what size do you need to scale out to? You know, how much capacity do you need to add? So knowing the size of, you know, your containers um, is is uh, a factor that you need to, to add into the equation. So, you know, uh, you'd probably have to come up with some logic that's something along the lines of how many of the largest container can you fit uh, on the remaining excess capacity? And if it's less than one, uh, then it's time to scale out. But then, you know, as we've been saying all week, scaling in is actually the harder part of the equation. So how do you figure out what, you know, when it's time to scale in? And again, it would be a sort of a, an equation that factors in how many of the largest uh, containers um, can you fit or how much excess capacity do you have? And can you take away one unit, one EC2 instance, and still have enough to be able to scale up uh, after you're done. Yeah. So there's all kinds of like relatively complicated logic that that you'd have to implement, and people have done it. It's not it's not certainly not impossible to do, but it's never been this easy. So now what we want is to just allow everyone to have this kind of capability without having to. Uh, really get super uh, deep into the trenches of, you know, figuring out all of this logic. And then, you know, keeping your logic updated with, you know, now you're suddenly deploying an even larger container than ever before. Uh, what do you have to go and change in your in your scale logic to, to accommodate that? Well, with capacity providers, you don't have to worry about that. We will adjust, you know, for you. So I think it's a really cool thing. You know, another um, another question that I uh, hear all the time is, uh, what if I want to use some spot and some regular? Uh, you know, I want to keep like a, a baseline of regular, but I want to be able to burst into the spot priced, um, you know, compute um, so that I can, you know, grow but not have to like have my costs grow at that same rate so uh i understand capacity providers might be able to help us with that too yes. am i right yes teed it up and I, I'll, I'll knock it out but yeah so um 
Absolutely. So the, the nice thing about capacity providers, and we'll, we'll dive into it for the, the cluster auto scaling piece, um, but you can specifically, and it doesn't have to even be for cluster auto scaling, but you can say you set a base and a weight. So I could set a base, uh, and you can have up to, I believe it's 10 capacity providers per cluster as your as your default. So imagine if I wanted to deploy a, a, a back-end service, and I knew that five of those back end I always I need five running at all times that's that's my my lowest point but then anything above that would be great because it'll help us speed up our, our processing but it's not necessary so you could uh, using capacity providers set a base of five for capacity provider on demand so you're going to know that that's always going to be scheduled to an on-demand instance let's say but anything let's say past that so then you could say for every one um, that I deploy after my base, uh, I, you could have another capacity provider that only points to spot instances, to an auto scaling group that's all spot. And then you could say for every one, I want to deploy four on spot. So now you're getting a ton of processing and you're taking advantage of you know, the cost savings with spot. And I like what you did there just, just then. You actually didn't just say, make all my burst spot you actually said make 80% of my burst spot exactly. and 20% is still going to stay on demand. That's an interesting concept. That's an interesting thought. So I didn't even realize that could, I did realize, but still, uh, I think it's worth pointing out that it actually can get to be that uh, sophisticated. So that's, that's really cool. Yeah. Yeah. That's a great point to, to bring up his spot, but um, so, so, what we'll we'll demo is two things. One, we're going to demo cluster auto scaling. So we're going to add EC2 infrastructure uh, you know, to our cluster, and then we're going to set up uh, cluster auto scaling there. But first, what we're going to do is we're going to set up a Fargate um, and Fargate spot capacity provider strategy. So we've been talking about EC2 uh, as our our um, data plane, but we haven't really talked a lot about Fargate. So Fargate. You know, relatively recently, within the past year, we announced uh, Fargate Spot availability. So it's a way to deploy Fargate tasks, but at spot pricing. So um, let's actually get right into that. And with capacity providers, we're going to see how we can deploy um, a, a baseline of Fargate as our, our main baseline requirement tasks. And then, as I mentioned earlier, we'll have for every one Fargate task we'll deploy, I think we set it to four Fargate spot tasks we'll deploy. So, awesome. And cool. by the way, uh, if you're live on Twitch right now, uh, if you have any questions, throw them in the chat. Uh, while Adam is is working on um, the uh, bringing this stuff up, I will try and uh, bring up any questions you guys have. So we'll be watching the chat for any questions. Perfect. Okay. So to get started, the, the first thing we want to do is we want to enable capacity providers on our cluster. So you can do this in two ways. One, the command line, or two, you could always go to your cluster in the console, click update cluster, and you can add your capacity provider strategy here. Now, I tend to not do things um, from the console. I tend to do them from the command line. So let's head back. And the, the first step is we need to actually create a, a capacity provider. So before we can even enable uh, a strategy, we need to, uh, the capacity providers on our cluster, we need to create a capacity provider strategy. So, so a capacity it, provider is essentially just, where am I going to get the compute? Bingo, exactly. And then the strategy will be, when will I use that compute? Right. So um, when, we, when we look at this command, if we break it apart, um, essentially what we're doing is we're, we're saying, here's our cluster that we want to um, put a capacity provider. And here's what our default strategy is. Now, Fargate and Fargate Spot um, are just, those are capacity providers on their own, okay? Um, meaning I don't have to create a separate capacity provider uh, to, to work with that because it's just two for Fargate. So, it, but what, what, what you'll see with, the cluster auto scaling piece is I actually, before I do this, I will create my own capacity provider. And we'll, we'll show you that uh, in a moment. And when you do that, you're, you're saying, here's my auto scaling group. Um, and there's more details uh, there. Okay. 
So we're saying, here's our capacity provider. We want this to be our default uh, strategy of Fargate with a, a base of one. So when we say base, base is our, our basically requirement. So in this strategy, I need before anything else takes place, I need to make sure that I have one Fargate task deployed. Then after that, we have the weights. So the weight is basically that percentage of how many do I do I want to be running on one uh, capacity provider uh, compared to the other? Is there a question, Brent? I saw a smile. No, but I do think you could probably blow up the font a notch or two. Thank you. All right, let's do that. I did it. I did it three. So I think that's better. Okay. So if, cool. if it's still not good, let me know. Um, so, so here what we're saying is what we want uh, after we deploy our base of one Fargate task, we want for every one Fargate task that's deployed, four Fargate spot tasks. So this is taking care of the logic of figuring out that on every time a new task comes up, what strategy is it going to follow and how is it going to be deployed? If you think about that for a minute, that's a crazy amount of logic to have to figure out on our own. And I frankly, I, I love this, but to figure this out on my own would be very hard. So to just have this built in and, and ready to go, it's just, it's awesome. Like this is, it's yeah. exciting stuff. So I'm going to apply it now. Uh, so I'm going to my Cloud9 IDE here and I'm going to uh, uh, run the command. And so you can see it's, basically in the process of updating. And that really takes seconds. If I go here in the console now, you can see here's my strategy. So I got my Fargate provider as one with the base of one. So we're always gonna have that one. And then our weights for Fargate and Fargate spot. Cool. Cool, okay. So that was awesome. So we've gone through that, we have it going, it's great. But now let's add some EC2 capacity to our club, I'm sorry. <laughs> jump the gun there. Let's, uh, now we're going to go to our, our, we have a, an application that we're going to run that is called, uh, ECS demo capacity providers. And this application we're, we're going to deploy is actually going to tell us what we're, uh, every time we make a call to a load balancer, what that container, what that, uh, launch type it is. So what capacity, st uh, strat planning, geez, Louise, that's a tongue twister right there. <laughs> what capacity provider strategy it's running? Whew. That was a tongue twister. Okay. Yeah. Let me help you out. Uh, <laughs> so it's basically just going to report on itself, and it's going to tell us, is it Fargate or Fargate Spot? Exactly. Thank you. So, um, and this is an example of what that'll look like, what the response output will look like. So let's go ahead and deploy it. So again, we're using the CDK. Um, I have, and actually we can look at the code while, while this is running. It'll take a moment to deploy. Um, so we go to Fargate and let's open up this code here. Shoot, let's do it this way, Fargate. And let's take a look at what we're building. So as I'm doing with all my other applications, we have our service team that's building and managing um, our, our, our platform, right? So that's our, our platform service team. So I'm just importing all those resources that they've built, you know, they being the hypothetical they. And I'm just building it, and again, I'm using that high level construct application load balance service, which is building a load balancer for me. It's, um, it's giving me everything I need for my service to run as behind a load balancer to get registered health checked and all, all that good stuff. And then here's my, while my you're in. Docker image. Oh. Go ahead. Sorry. sorry. Uh, while you're in here, uh, just to answer a question from chat, Uday19 asks, can I create a Fargate cluster in an existing VPC? Take a look at this code and, um, or actually in the platform code, we build a VPC and then in this, code uh, we build the cluster actually we still might build the cluster in the platform the short answer is yes the longer answer is a couple of couple of factors uh one you can see the code where we're doing it here and then two 
we aren't really building what I would call a Fargate cluster. What we're building is an ECS cluster, and all ECS clusters uh, are hybrid, where they can run either Fargate tasks or EC2 tasks and mix them together. So that's worth noting that, you know, whatever you're building today can expand its functionality and you can use, you know, the other compute capacity uh, tomorrow if you decide that that uh, is what you want to do. And, and even a step further on that, it, you just made me, reminded me is, again, when we talk about a cluster, it's just a, a namespace. This is just a logical way to group my, my containers. And... You know, what, one thing that's common when we talk clusters in anything, when you're managing a cluster, what's one thing that you have to do? You have to manage upgrades to that cluster, right? You have to think about upgrades. And Brent, we've had, you know, many a times in our past where we've had to upgrade clusters, get woken oh, yeah. up at night because a failed upgrade happened. Well, the good news is, is that's completely transparent to you. You, you as, a, as a user of ECS, you don't think about upgrading a cluster. That's not a something you worry about when i'm talking to customers in person one of the questions i'll sometimes throw out there is um oh what version of ecs are you running and they'll stop for a second kind of scratch their head and and they'll say you know i don't really know and i was and i'll usually then respond trick question <laughs> there are no versions you don't have to worry about upgrades we just handle that for you you never even realize it so yeah that's uh that's one of the cool things about ecs is you know, you aren't tied to a specific version and uh, you don't have to worry about how, figuring out like a maintenance window to to upgrade all of your, you know, control plane nodes or anything like that. Um, so, yeah, we've had a couple other comments just saying hi in the chat and then Bob Moff uh, uh, apparently uh, agrees with us and loves uh, the CDK cloud development kit. So cool. that's awesome. Yeah, I, I just I. I... I could literally talk about CDK all day. I just, it's so much fun. I, I, I'm just weird, I guess, but I guess Bob gets me, you know, Bob, we're on the same page. <laughs> totally. It's not weird. It's you've lived through the pain right. and now you just want everyone else to understand how much better this is. Exactly. Um, okay. So our service is deployed. One other thing I did want to point out is we do set the platform version. So with Fargate, as we improve functionality, we may release a new version of, of the Fargate platform. Um, but what's great is when that com when it comes to upgrading that, you simply switch your version and then your task, the next time it deploys, it's gonna deploy to that, that new version, so. Yep, and if you don't wanna worry about doing that, you can use latest. Exactly. Okay, so we have deployed our service. Um, so what it gave me was it was a load balancer URL in the output here, and let's let's move this terminal up, and let's let's do a curl, and then we're gonna pipe it to JQ, which will make that JSON pretty, and we can see that it's it's kind of hard to read. Let's actually go here. Is let's zoom in. There we go. Okay. So I'm this is my load balancer. This is the application I deployed. Let's take a look at everything that, that's in our cluster. What what this application does, this service, is it scans all the tasks in the cluster and it checks what the, the, the strategy is that that particular task is using, what capacity strategy. So some may have their own outside of the default. So in this case though, what I'm doing is I'm deploying a task to the cluster and I'm using the default cluster strategy. This is something I didn't bring up earlier is if I have other tasks that I want to use a different capacity provider strategy for, guess what? I can. I don't have to use the cluster default. So that's just another cool thing that you're not tied to, you know, what's set as a default on the cluster. You can go outside of that and do your own. You might have some critical tasks that you want to guarantee are always executed on, on demand. Um, and you might want those to follow one strategy, possibly the default, possibly not default. And then you might have a different strategy altogether that you could set for like, you know, some other slightly less critical tasks that are more ephemeral and you're willing to be a little bit more risky with just because uh, you want to save some money. You're telling me that you can do that? Yep. 
Exactly. Exactly. So it, pretty neat that, that you have the control over how you do this, right? Like you're not just tied to the default. Okay. So here's, let, let, let's just take a look at one of these. At first, I'm going to actually refresh a couple times. So you can see down here, this is my ARN and then my strategy. So every time, oh, there we go. I just landed on a Fargate spot container. If I do it again, Fargate spot, Fargate spot, Fargate spot. We have a lot of Fargate spots and there's Fargate. So looking at these, these tasks here, if we count them, we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Did I count that right? And then one, two, three Fargate tasks. So I said I want my base of one, so that gives us nine. And then for every one, I want four. The math's a little tricky here. I'm I'm kind of I'm kind of losing it here in the math. <laughs> <laughs> but the bottom line is, we're achieving that strategy. Okay. For every one uh, on demand Fargate, we're gonna get an additional four uh, spot before we get the next one on demand Fargate. Exactly. exactly. So imagine five buckets one is on demand four are spot we're going to start filling those one at a time round robin fill, keep filling them until we are we have all the capacity that we need yep and so here we go so that's pretty cool so using capacity providers i was able to deploy a fargate task a, a service that all i all i ask is that you know for every one we have four spot uh, spot in instances of that running. Understanding that if spot needs to reclaim capacity, I'm totally cool with that because I have my baseline of Fargate services running. So tasks running. So that's pretty awesome. And you can get super creative here. Like, of course, the examples and demos are, are usually pretty straightforward, but obviously you can get more advanced and, and, and super creative and, and make this work for your services uh, in your clusters. So that's it for um, the Fargate piece. That was that was it. I, and let, let's review. I mean, it, go ahead. It's pretty like you, you're saying that's it. But in my opinion, I'm, I'm thinking to myself, wow, that was super simple. So, you know, keep just keeping with Fargate in general, Fargate usage. We you know, the idea is to keep things simple. So um, it doesn't have to be much more complicated than what you just laid out. That's pretty awesome. Yeah. And, you know, from a, from a management perspective, I'm not thinking about patching instances. I'm not thinking about, you know, I don't have to build a bunch of extra logic to think about how I can implement cost savings with Spot. It's just there. It's just there and yeah. it's awesome. So, scale up, save money, scale down. Save even more money. Exactly. Awesome. Exactly. <laughs> and, and just looking at the cluster here. So the one thing I didn't mention was I deployed 10 uh, tasks. So I created this service and I wanted 10 tasks running behind that service. So, I mean, pretty awesome. Like, like just the, the things you can do, um, it's in such a simple way. It's pretty, it's pretty amazing. So, okay. So now we're going to move to the, the cluster auto scaling piece. So to do that, I'm just going to, for the sake of the demo, I'm actually going to remove our default strategy because I'm going to create a new default strategy. Okay, so if I go back, you can see. And and by the way, we have just we just released um, the functionality to be able to do that delete that I just did through the command line. We just, so through the, the SDK, I should say. So that's done. Um, and what I'll do is I don't have to destroy it. I'm going to just keep it up and running. And now I want to move uh, to the EC2 portion and, and show some cluster auto scaling. Cool. So, and this is while you're, while you're uh, getting ready for that, just keep in mind uh, Twitch that this is going to be slightly more complicated because now what we're dealing with is is trying to fit all of our containers inside of uh, additional capacity that isn't always going to be sized the same way. So you know our containers one size. Well, when we bring up Fargate, 
we're bringing up capacity that's equal to that size. So it's super simple. But when we're talking about EC2, we're going to bring up an EC2 instance that's going to be like a, a completely different size, bigger. And so we'll, you know, we're going to have all this capacity that's going to be different, uh, sized differently that we're going to have to figure out how to use and how to fit our, our containers within. Uh, so that's why the, the capacity provider logic is so valuable because it's not something that we have to write, we have to build, uh, and we have to manage and maintain. AWS can do that for us now. So that's really cool. Yep. And um, so I am using, so again, going back to CDK, I have there. there's a, a method I can call within my um, cluster object that, I, that is called add capacity. So... I mean, th this is, again, the things with CDK that just bring me so much joy is I'm adding EC2 capacity to my cluster right now, which is going to create an auto scaling group. It's going to create a launch configuration. Um, it's going to in the uh, so, so one thing with EC2 instances, which, by the way, is really it's nothing crazy at all. But in the user data, which is a, uh, basically a, a script that runs when your instance comes up. We need to make sure that our instance is registered to the cluster. It's a simple echo command. You just echo cluster name into an ECS config. This handles that for me. I mean, this really checks all the boxes to make sure that I have EC2 instances in my cluster ready to go and registered. So that's what I did. And so, it, this is the platform so, repo. Go ahead. So a developer, you know, can just know, hey, I need to have capacity here. So I identify that I want to run T3 smalls. Um, I want to have between zero and 10, and that's all they need to worry about. They don't have to get into the nitty gritty of, you know, how does this all get attached into the right cluster and, and all that stuff. So that's, uh, that's really cool. And that's what the CDK is really all about is just, is just abstracting away the, the boilerplate and letting you be specific about only the things that you need to be specific about. Yeah, that's a that's a great point. I love the the boilerplate. That is exactly it. It just takes all that boilerplate logic and takes care of it for you. Totally. So now while that's deploying, so what we should see is at some point here in the near future, um, I'm going to have EC2 instances come up, and they're going to then register into my cluster. And, you know, it just something that I really like about the console view of ECS and within the cluster is it gives me a, a centralized way to view all my services, tasks, instances, pretty much everything that's going on in my cluster, I can see it in one place, which is really nice. So ECS instances being one of those things. So it's going to take a moment because it's still deploying right now. So we got to wait a, a few minutes for that to happen. Yeah, you think about the process we have to bring up. We have to provision uh, a launch. What, what is it called? A launch config. Mm -hmm. Then uh, then from there, uh, provision an autoscale group, attach the launch config to it. Then it's going to actually uh, try and bring up EC2 instances uh, based on that launch config and so on and so forth. And then we have to get the green light that those instances are up and healthy then I think it'll be done. Yep. And, um, you know, one other thing was that AMIs, you know, when you think about EC2 instances, you have to think about your machine image. Your, your a, I, I will say AMI. I won't say AMI. I'm sorry. You know, it's really, speaking of that, <laughs> I thank you for saying AMI, but I heard one person, like, they almost converted me to saying Amy. And I was like, oh, my gosh, that actually makes the most sense of any of it. Like, so Amy, that's, if I had, if that was the first thing I'd ever heard, I would totally say Amy, but you know, I'm stuck on AMI now. Yeah. I'm committed. And, and this is another one of those cultural debates that, you know, it's just, I, I, I try to stay away from, but that's, I just, I say AMI, I, I don't know. I, uh, I'm, tr I'm trying. Um, yeah. Well, okay. So it's done. Our environment's uh, it's built the EC2 instances. Let's go back to the cluster, just confirm that we got some things coming up. 
so it looks like they, they, they it's created um, the auto scaling groups and all of that. But what needs to happen now is the auto scale groups need to actually look and say, hey, I don't have anything running. Let, let's get some instances deployed. And actually, I believe now that I think about it in my my logic, I set it to zero. Let's confirm. Yeah, that. that's I just realized that, yeah, the minimum was zero, so it's not going to bring any up until it needs them. Yep. And I did this intentionally, and we'll see why as we deploy our capacity provider. So now I'm going to go back to our, our capacity uh, provider app repo, um, where we have our, our demo app. And I'm going to run a couple commands before I, I start um, deploying other things. So what I want to do is I want to get that auto scaling group because I'm going to create a capacity provider now with cluster auto scaling enabled. And in order to do that, it needs to look at an auto scaling group. So I need to get the auto scaling group information and I just dy dy am dynamically creating a, a capacity provider name. Obviously you'd probably want one more meaningful, but for the sake of the demo, I just do it with the date because I may demo multiple times. That's why I do that. So in the um, command line here, using the AWS CLI, we're going to create a capacity provider. So remember, Fargate, Fargate spot, those capacity providers, those are there by default. But now anything with EC2 involved, I have to create a capacity provider on my own because it has to point to an autoscaler group. So let's break this command apart really quick just so we can understand what we're doing. So we're creating the capacity provider. We're naming it. And then we're saying some of the details of how we want this um, capacity provider to function. So we're saying, here's our auto scale group. Do we want managed scaling enabled? So you, you don't have to have managed scaling enabled. You could still, if you wanted to do cluster auto scaling on your own or not do that, you could. But in the case here, we are enabling it. And what we're saying here in the next uh, portion of the command is target capacity. And we're setting it to 80%. So target capacity is basically saying, I want 20% excess capacity at all times. Because if my applications need to scale out, I want to make sure that I have some idle resources there. So I don't have to wait the couple minutes for cluster auto scaling to kick in and then to schedule my tasks. So the idea is I always want a little bit of extra overhead. I just did this in the demo. And again, every use case is different. So the, I've seen some where target capacity is 50% because you need that burst right away. So you want idle capacity. But another thing or is you... Blue-green deploys might actually encourage 50% because you need to double your capacity on every deploy and then take away you know the old uh, version afterwards. So that would almost suggest that you, know, you need at least 50% excess available. Yeah, great point. Great point. So that th these are um, things that, you know, just depending on your situation, you, you tweak it as you see fit. You can go 100 too. Uh, you know, you could really just say, I don't want any idle capacity. And to me, that's the ideal state is I want 100% um, utilization. I don't want to pay for anything extra until I have to. Um, and then there's one more. <laughs> what, what's, what's so funny? Was it, did I say something? No, I just happened to look at the the chat and and someone said asks, and I'm gonna I'm gonna get this. Uh, it's funny. Do you say API or API? <laughs> and Thank it just you. struck me funny. So uh, so yeah, thanks for that. Um, I I feel like now I want to try saying API um, all the time. Let's so, see. Let's see if we can change it. And but let's let's tr let's start the movement right here right now. First time I go back to an AWS office and talk to a developer, I'm going to say "appy" and just see how long I can get away with it before they before they actually say something to me. And you know it's going to be uncomfortable for a, a few minutes because they're going to be like, oh, yeah. "What is he saying?" Like, <laughs> and then at some point they'll probably say, "Brent, are you saying API?" And you're like, "Yeah, appy." I love that. That's Can awesome. awesome. Can't wait. Oh, that's good. Uh, if I, I hope I'm on my to-do list going to be on my to-do list until <laughs> until we go back to the office yeah and i want to make sure i'm there when that happens please let me know um 
Totally. Okay, so the, the last piece to this is um, manage termination protection. So in the demo, I'm not enabling it, which means that when, if, when I scale down, it's just going to, if there's tasks running on those uh, uh, instances that we're going to scale down, doesn't matter. It's just going to kill them. But it's, it's quite possible that you don't want that to be the case. So when you enable managed termination protection, it's going to ensure that there are no contain, no tasks running on the nodes that are going to be um, killed. And, you know, the only, with the only exception being daemon sets, because again, a, a, a daemon um, is once run once on every instance that that's the exception. So if you have a, a daemon yeah. running, that doesn't matter. That's going to go away. Yeah. You expect those to always be there. So it makes sense to have to kill them. Yeah. So just to be clear, it's probably a good idea to have this on managing termination protection when you're talking about uh, production, but for demo purposes, it, it increases the scale down time. So for demo purposes, we're going to uh, keep it off, um, but don't do that in production. Agreed. Thank you, Brent. That's a great point. Um, so, okay. So I, I ran the command and I have now created my capacity provider. Okay. And remember, you can have multiple capacity providers uh, for a cluster. So um, we've created our capacity provider. Now I want to enable this as my default capacity provider strategy for this ECS cluster. And in this case, I'm just saying my base is one and my weight is one because I just have one capacity provider here. But, uh, you know, a, a common strategy is to have an auto scaling group for, uh, for each availability zone. And if I was doing that, I could have three capacity providers here within each weight of one, base of one for one of the capacity providers. And then it would deploy across all AZs evenly, scale those accordingly as well. And then to go a step further, I could have three of three on demand capacity uh, auto scaling groups and then it could have three auto scaling groups with spot enabled yeah. right so just and again that's how you get creative and and you know have some fun with it totally all right that is that is very sophisticated and uh still pretty easy to pull off now so that's that's what's really cool about this this functionality and i love when the you know the demo gods look upon me with with rage and try to upset me, but I will not mm -hmm. let them get me down here. It looks like there's an error. So let's actually, that's fun. I'm glad we came across an error. It's the first time. Resource in use. So let's see why it's in use. Uh, let's go back to ECS. And let's go to my capacity provider. Did I name it something funky? So that's when you deleted the Fargate ones, but you didn't delete the the other thing you mentioned. Uh, is that what? I, mean, I don't know. Maybe that's why. I mean, because, yeah, so you're right, Brent. All right. CDK destroy. And I'm going to do it with a dash F. So we're going to get rid of the, the Fargate deployment because you're right. And, you know, I, I, I forget why I do things in, you know, the workshop. I implemented this and I forgot why. So there's a reason we destroy it because we're, we're removing the default, but I already have tasks that are using that default. So that default yeah. strategy. So I wonder about that. Thank you, Brent. But, cool. So that, that, that'll take a moment. It's going to, remove the task, clean everything up. And while that happens, um, let's actually just look at what, what we're gonna do. So once we deploy, um, actually, you know what? Let, what I wanna do is I wanna look at the CDK code while this is running. Let's look at the CDK code for EC2. And I wanna compare it to the Fargate deployment to show you the difference because it's really not that much different. So take a look here. 
I'm using this high level construct, which is again, these, these patterns. And this is under the AWS ECS patterns construct library for CDK. Um, and you look, I have application load balanced EC2 service compared to application load balanced, uh, is it here? Fargate service. So when you compare the two together, they're pretty much the same. The difference is I just want to make sure that this deploys to EC2 as our uh, data plane and not Fargate. So that's what's happening here. CDK is just so awesome. I know we say that so many times, but like, it really is. I just, I can't get over it. It's fun. And, and you know, if, especially if you, if you don't want to, you know, when we think, you know, application first as our, our tenant, like to be able to write my, or deploy my, whatever it is I want to deploy my service as a container or whatever it is I want to deploy it as, to be able to do that in the language that I'm either writing my, my code in or a, a programming language in general that may not be what I'm writing my code in, but it's a programming language, that's pretty powerful. I don't have to think about YAML and JSON. I just yeah. I just do this. It's, it's pretty fantastic. And you can have for loops and you can have conditionals and, and you know, stuff like that. I mean, it's so much much of an improvement over i mean i've written tons and tons of puppet i've written tons and tons of chef uh tons and tons of terraform that was extra emphasis by the way and uh i mean i loved terraform when i started using it because it was it was so great but if you think about like all the parts of terraform that you would have to write to do what we're doing here it wouldn't be a dozen lines, you know, like this is a dozen lines. That's, that's what's incredible about it. So, um, yeah, I love that, that this exists today. It's just a constant improvement and a constant, uh, you know, move up, uh, in levels of abstraction. Yeah. That's, ex yeah. It's, it's just, you're, you're, you're moving up where you're abstracting more and more of the stuff that while it's important, I don't want to know about it. I don't want to have to be an expert in all these things. So just get me as close to my application as I can be with, with doing the, the, the minimum um, that I have to do. So yeah, that's a great point. And, and while Terraform's amazing and, and CloudFormation are amazing, um, I, I have to think about every single component when I'm building, building those. And that aside, just to be able to, to have my logic, you know, at the, to add, as you said, for loops and, and conditional logic in, in a way that's native to a programming language, that's, that's pretty nice. So anyway, we're still waiting for our resources to delete. Um, that it just takes a few minutes. It's, it's deleting the load balancer. Let me see if I have it. It looks like the service is completely gone. So that's good. I don't see it. Yeah, you might be at a stage where you can go ahead with your next deploy. So let's, yeah, let's give it a shot here. So we will go here. And let's, let's, let's see if we can run that command again. Okay. <laughs> let's see. Let me, I'm going to just create a new capacity provider. We're going to, you know what, that may, wait, let's see. Let's look through. This is good. This is like real time doing this live. Can I contain a capacity provider that is not associated with is this lack of environment variables, maybe in a different terminal? You know what, I can, I'm just, oh, another nice thing about CDK is I just canceled that, right? And normally, like if I was stuck to my terminal and I canceled something that was synchronous, uh-oh, I'm waiting. But no, this is all in CloudFormation. Remember, CDK builds the assembly code in CloudFormation and deploys it asynchronously. That was just a nice way for me to visually see it in the UI, but or on the command line. But it's still deleting those resources, even though I canceled it. That's 
a good point. I didn't think about that. And there we go. Brent, you were right. The troubleshooter extraordinaire. Thank you. Um, years and years of experience. <laughs> so it, it's just, it, you know, Brent, you always, I got to tell you, when, when things are hit the fan, Brent always has a cool head, level head, and he just gets to the, to the bottom of it. So there we go. Nice. So what we've done is we have deployed this. Uh, we've enabled this capacity provider as our default uh, cluster strategy. So if I go to the strategy you can see here, remember I named it EC2 in a date uh, epoch time timestamp. So there it is. So awesome. We've done it. And we went through what we were doing, what we deployed. So now we have it running. Now let's actually deploy um, an EC2 back service using the CDK again. And you know what? I'm just going to go I'm going to actually no, we're going to start with one. I'm on Fargate. Deploy. I hope that's not too loud on the microphone. He's slamming away on the keys. <laughs> I should have muted probably. I feel sorry for your keyboard. <laughs> I'm not even typing hard. It's just I want to be cool and have a loud keyboard. So people. I think Keyboard disagrees. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. So now we're deploying our service. Um, one other thing, you know, we've talked about this many times, but uh, this particular service, um, I need it to, it makes API calls um, to, uh, against ECS. It, this is how we're able to print this information is we give it permission. We're basically giving it uh, permission via IAM to access these uh, commands, th these calls via the, the API. So that's running. That's going to get deployed. It's going to take just a, a couple minutes because, again, what are we doing? We're deploying a load balancer. We're deploying a service uh, that goes behind that load balancer. There's security groups that have to be configured, which I don't think we've talked about security groups much, but that's another aspect of this that CDK handles from that boilerplate is connecting our load balancer to our service, that's all managed. Because I defined my port in my in my service definition, if you remember. So the CDK is smart enough to say, well, obviously this port is where your application's running. We're going to make sure that we create a security group that connects the load balancer to that port and only to that port. So Makes sense. All right. So that's going to deploy for another minute or two. And then we'll, we'll, what we'll do is we'll examine it. And the key here is, let's go back to the console because that actually reminds me, is if you noticed when we deployed the auto scaling group, we deployed it with zero instances. Do you remember that? Mm -hmm. And in our capacity provider, I said, I want 80% or I want that extra 20% of overhead at all times. So look what happened. The second I enabled the capacity provider on this cluster, it talked to the auto scale group and said, we don't have any instances running. We need to set, we need to have that 20% buffer. So it, it launched those instances. It modified the auto scaling group to launch the instances, instances to give me that buffer right away, which I thought so was cool. pretty cool, right? So I mean, it basically puts instant manage, instance management on autopilot almost. Yeah. Yeah, it really does. So that's running. It's just going to, it takes a few minutes because of my blunder earlier. But um, so what we'll see it is, it is uh, I, I, what I'm going to do is once it's deployed, we're going to see there's going to be one task running, which is okay because we have plenty of capacity to support that one task running, right? Because we have, mm -hmm. look at our capacity here. And you can already see I, it's deployed the service. So I have one task running on this particular container instance. I've got plenty of CPU and memory available right now. But what happens when we need to scale to 10 and we don't have enough capacity? And so that's what we're going to see. Let's find out. <laughs> so here's our service. And you can see it's, it's in the process of, of coming up. And we'll, we will find out in a moment, I promise. As soon as as soon as the deployment's done, 
So we can take a look here. It looks like, and another cool thing is when you drill down into the service is if you have a load balancer, it's gonna tell you what, what target group you're, you're pointing at. Um, like just all these things that are, I think, you know, when, when you go and drill down in the console to a service, you wanna know all this stuff up front. It makes it very easy to understand where do I need to go if I need to troubleshoot something. But also, it tells you, here's your capacity provider strategy. And because I can set that when I deploy a task, I didn't, and it went, it wound up using the default available. So, all right, we have our task running. I'm feeling like this, this will be done any minute. Um, and actually what we can do is in the meantime, I just wanna go to the load balancer and we can actually see Let's go to our load balancer. I'm in the console here. We're, we're approaching one, but the good news is we're approaching 1 p.m. Pacific. We're gonna go a little bit over today. I hope everyone's okay with that. Um, and I actually want to, let's find the DNS name. Well, there's so many here, but this is the one. So if I go here, there it is. Okay, perfect. So this is that same appy that I deployed. And I mean, <laughs> you see, I was trying to just, just squeeze it in there. That's and great. take a look here. So I have all my tasks running, because remember, we have our tasks for our front end application and our back end, but I also have other tasks that are running as well. Those aren't using the default strategy, but I deployed another task that is using the default strategy. And you can see, here's that capacity provider strategy we're using. All right, now let's change it to deploy more than what we have available. So this is the meat and potatoes here. This is the fun part. So what right. we're gonna do, just gonna about do, to get real. I'm gonna do a CDK diff, which is going to say, hey, what do you have? What are you proposing to change? So we're going from one to 10. So let's deploy. And so what the deploy is gonna do is it's going to go to the ECS service. It's going to modify that count from 1 to 10. And what we'll see shortly thereafter is pretty quickly we're going to see, so here's our service count. It's changed. Now the ECS scheduler is going to recognize we need 10 tasks running. Let's start to plan for that and let's get them running. And we'll look up here in our uh, cluster view and we'll see we should be able to schedule most of those pretty quickly. And we did. We have six tasks for this service running right now. They're ready to rock and roll. But what's gonna happen in the next minute or two is uh, the capacity provider of the cluster is going to recognize, I have four tasks that are in a provisioning state that need resources of e uh, EC2 compute resources that aren't available. So. It's going to happen pretty quickly where we're going to see our um, instance count jump, okay? Because if you look now, I have CPU available, but I don't have enough memory available to deploy my tasks. And that's ultimately what's going to trigger. And this goes back to what Brent was talking about earlier. There's so many things you need to consider when scaling your, your, your data plane. Um, and so capacity providers handles that for us. Right? They're thinking about the hard stuff. I don't have to think about the hard stuff anymore. So it's going to take a, a minute or two. And what we'll see is the, the capacity provider is going to um, essentially recognize that it needs to add more to there. And I want to just cheat a little bit. And we can look at some of the alarms. Um, but essentially, it's creating a target tracking policy that it's looking at these particular metrics. And once we're the provider reservation is greater than what we need, it's going to trigger a, a scaling event. Is less than what we need is going to trigger. So we did event. target tracking yesterday for scaling our containers. And now you're pointing out that this is also using target tracking for scaling our EC2 instances. That's really cool that, you know, you can fit fit together all the same uh, information or same services to do 
you know, basically different things. Yep. And it's, so this is just simply looking, is our reservation greater than 80%? And it checks basically on every data point every minute. It's checking on this one data point every minute. And you can see it went into an alarm state. So look here. Remember earlier we deployed, we didn't have enough. It came down. We deployed our one, we were good. And now all of a sudden we're at 150 uh, percent of uh, reservation required that we we don't have available. So that alarm in the back end is going to trigger a scaling event of our EC2 instances. And we could actually look at the EC2 auto scaling group. And we we will be able to see the actual actually the auto scaling happening uh, in real time. So look, four instances. So there was this event that triggered a, a, a scale out of our EC2 instances. Oh, I don't have the metrics enabled. But anyway, so we went from two instances here. Now if I refresh, now we have four instances. So what it did was it looked at our pending tasks, our tasks that were in a provisioning state that needed EC2 to run and it set an alarm, which triggered an auto scaling event, which provisioned the EC2 infrastructure we need. And now we have all of our containers running. So, and it auto scaled, right? It, yeah, I mean, obviously I said that, but take a look. Now we went from the one task that was running to 10 tasks that are running with this strategy. So cool. I mean, and again, didn't have to write any like crazy controller to to look at the situation. Didn't have to like have uh, you know something running on the cluster with excess privileges to be able to write you know changes into the cluster API or any of that kind of stuff. It just it just takes care of it all uh, on its own. Exactly. So cool. Exactly. Yeah. Just you know, it's just the little things and. So it's still in an alarm state, but what'll happen is very shortly, you can already see that number starting to come down. It's gonna, the capacity reservation will get back to as close to that 80% as possible. So basically it's gonna best effort, get me the amount of instances to get me to where I've said I, I wanna be from a capacity perspective. So that's it for um, capacity providers and what I could do is if I scale back down to one, what'll happen is as we talked about, you know, yesterday and the day before with auto scaling is the scale out process is a little faster, right? It's because scaling out is to meet instant demand. But when we scale back in, we're a little more uh, conservative and that's intentional to make sure that we don't just completely wipe out everything that's going on uh, just, you know, right away. So it's a slow step in process. To, to scale yourself totally. back down. So, so we have some questions in uh, chat. If you if you want to, if yeah. you have a minute. Uh, one Urban Blaster just says, uh, "Heart Fargate." So totally agree. Fargate like eliminates this as a as a decision point. Um, one of the things that that I like to think about, and I talk to other customers about, is. Um, how do you know when to use Fargate versus when to use EC2? And for me, my the way I make the decision for that is if I am going to be running uh, something that is uh, generic, you know, like it, like an appy, um, then Fargate is exactly the right use case for that. I love uh, running, you know, regular workloads. Uh, on a compute platform like Fargate, because then I don't have to think about anything below my container. Um, when I need something specialized, like uh, scheduling a GPU, for example, uh, maybe I have some uh, machine learning or, or something that can benefit from having GPU access, uh, that's something that Fargate can't do. And uh, so I need to bring specialized instances into the mix and uh, I could use a capacity provider to be able to do that. So that's when I think about uh, using EC2 instances uh, instead of Fargate. 
TrueSec123 uh, says, why use EKS if this is so well in uh, machine learning or, or something that can benefit from having GPU access? Uh, that's something that Fargate can't do. And uh, so I need to bring specialized instances into the mix. And uh, I could use a capacity provider to be able to do that. So that's when I think about uh, using EC2 instances uh, instead of Fargate. TrueSec123 uh, says, why use EKS if this is so well integrated with AWS? And again, it's a similar kind of question with a similar kind of answer. Uh, the difference, though, is the scenario. So we have two uh, terrific orchestrators that we can use to manage our containers. And really, uh, you know, if, if I have a customer asking me which should they use, I usually turn it around and ask them, you know, are you using, uh, all, are you all in on AWS? Or do you have workloads that run outside of AWS also? And that is like my first decision point for figuring out what orchestrator I might want to use. If I'm all in on AWS, I think ECS is a terrific choice. It has it has incredible integrations. Um, you know, turn on service discovery, it's a checkbox. Turn on, uh, you know, capacity providers, you saw how easy it was. It was slightly more than a checkbox. Um, you have, of course, the ability to launch things on Fargate and uh, mix in the, the ability to launch things on EC2. So ECS is definitely uh, a go-to when I'm all in on AWS. But if I have workloads that also run in maybe a data center that I, that I uh, have around that I still have to, to use, then uh, that's when I'll probably start to think about using EKS instead because I want, I want the same experience everywhere and I can run Kubernetes in my data center and get a really terrific container orchestrator. And then I also can have Kubernetes via EKS uh, running in AWS and have a really terrific experience uh, using that orchestrator as well. So that's kind of uh, how I decide which to use. Um, so a couple of other questions. Is can there I, something Can I chime in on that really quick? Oh yeah, go just, for it. Just one other piece I want to add to that, and it, it's not uncommon to have to use both. So we, you know, like it's I talk to customers that have, um, you know, it, if you have service teams that have preferences towards certain orchestrators, it's it's not uncommon to have one team use an EKS. They have a small cluster for their application, their services, and then another team using ECS. And hey, guess what? We have App Mesh, which is a service mesh that can help integrate all of these together as well. So I just wanted to add to that, that I think they're, it's not sometimes they're, they're both there. It's okay to, to love both and to use both. Right? Absolutely. Um, so TrueSec also asks, is there something ECS can't do that EKS does? Um, I think there probably is, you know, these orchestrators are developed independently of each other and uh, they're definitely going to have uh, different, you know, differing feature sets and differing uh, roadmaps. Um, but that said, I think it's, you know, it's cool to be able to have the choice and to use whatever is the best tool to solve whatever problem you're up against. Um, and then of course the opposite question or can't do as well as EKS, uh, you know, same answer. It's uh, pick the best tool for the best job and that quest that answer is not going to be the same every time. So, um, Speaking of EKS, uh, so this was our last session for ECS workshop for the week. We're going to take tomorrow off. Um, but starting on Monday, uh, we're going to come back in the same time slot and do the same style of session uh, all week long. And we're going to be covering EKS workshops. So we're going to be walking through uh, the ins and outs of getting EKS running, what it is, and then we're going to get on to running uh, some workloads on EKS and uh, and continue on from there. So definitely join us uh, next week, same uh, time, same channel, and uh, we'll be walking through EKS and getting our containers running. Yes, um, I guess uh, you know a parting note here. Um, so so the URL here is uh, ecsworkshop.com. You absolutely don't need to uh, have a Twitch stream 
to run this workshop. You can do this on your own. It's just recommended that uh, you do it in a fresh account. Um, that way you can just kind of play with it, you know, break things, see how the, the internals work without any you know, fear of messing anything up. Um, and yeah, I mean, so, you know, just to recap the workshop. So we went from uh, basically an idea. We, ha we had an idea, we built an application, a three-tier polyglot application. Uh, we decided to use containers containers, uh, but we had a team that liked Python, we had a team that liked Ruby on Rails, we had a team that liked Node.js, a team that liked Crystal Lang. And what we did was, we took all of those components, uh, all those different languages, and we were able to deploy them all together uh, in a cluster where they can talk to each other, um, they were able to interact with one another, and ultimately give us this, this front end, this UI, um, that serves our application, all on ECS. And 99% of it was on Fargate, with the one exception when we deployed the one service to EC2 just to show cluster auto scaling. So this basically was all deployed in a in a serverless way, where I didn't have to think about patching, managing uh, EC2 instances. I just focused on my applications, getting my applications containerized, and then deployed and running in a highly available way um, in ECS. So. We also and what you did go ahead. when you did deploy to EC2, you still used a managed AMI where we, you know, will constantly uh, be updating that AMI ID with whatever the latest uh, version of our AMI is. So um, it's a good way to go. You know, it's a uh, it's it's as hands off as uh, as you can get, and definitely. Um, advanced level when it comes to, you know, reducing operational effort. Um, one last question, all is dark in the chat says is this similar to scaling Dynamo, uh, WCU and RCU. Um, I haven't looked at that in, well, probably years at this point, but it's similar. Uh, I would actually say our equivalent of that would be scaling based on, let's say, incoming transactions per second or something like that. And what we did uh, in our examples here uh, was, and this was just for demo purposes, we picked a metric that was uh, readily available to us. We, we scaled based on CPU utilization. Uh, but other than that, it, it's basically the same same idea. Yeah. Yeah, the idea is we want we, we we need ec2 in this use case to run our containers but we don't want to have to think about scaling that in and out so we let capacity providers handle that for us so same concept obviously just you know from a technical perspective there's there's differences but same idea all right uh join us next monday and we'll be back uh talking eks uh until then have a good weekend thank you and follow us on twitter if you want to see updates and, and talk about cool container stuff. All right, everybody, thank you so much.